However, let's just expand this issue over the, uh, over the use of gold. Uh, China established the Silk Road Gold Fund uh, a few years back as part of a Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and that is, uh, that is traded on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, now, the, uh, the idea behind that is an interesting one uh, because a lot of the countries along the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, especially in Central Asia, are poor. And I'm talking about countries like uh, Afghanistan uh, and uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan to some extent. And what the Silk Road Gold Fund is doing is, in, is investing in equipment into countries such as Afghanistan. It will, it will go in, provide the equipment, mine the gold, charge Afghanistan for this service. But uh, assuming the gold reserves are more than the cost of mining it, we'll split the proceeds of the gold reserves with the uh, sovereign nation and creating wealth for countries like Afghanistan. That to me sounds like a great idea. Um, and it's one of the initiatives that I think the, the China and the Belt and Road and countries that are participating in that can, be, can feel proud of. Thanks for watching this RTD interview. Don't forget to pick up your RTD Scary George round, only available at sdbullion.com. Now enjoy this interview. Welcome to Rethinking the Dollar. Today I'm excited to have first time guest, Mr. Chris Devonshire Ellis. He's a chairman and founding partner at Design Shira Associates, a company that provides strategic advice for the China's One Belt, One Road initiative. Today he's joining us to share his thoughts on the developments out in that region and a variety of other subject matter. So Chris, welcome to Rethinking the Dollar. Okay, great. Thanks. Good to be here. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to sit down with us. Uh, as I mentioned before, real curious about all the developments out in that region there. So looking forward to getting your thoughts on it. And so w would you mind sharing with us a little bit of your background and how you've arrived at this point in your career and, and what exactly is a con consulting aspect of what you do with the uh, One Belt and One Road initiative is? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, my firm, I, I set up in uh, 1992. Uh, in China, uh, and uh, we provide advisory, legal, tax, and other professional support services to foreign companies that want to establish operations in China. Um, uh, we've expanded since 1992 to, uh, to 13 offices right across China, in addition to Hong Kong. We're now in uh, Singapore, other ASEAN nations such as uh, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, so on and so forth. Uh, we're also in India, and we have operations in uh, Russia, uh, as well as uh, subsidiary or liaison offices uh, in Europe and in the States, by the way. Um, so we, uh, we provide advisory, as I said, to uh, foreign companies, predominantly North American and European businesses that want to establish operations throughout China and the Asian region. And uh, of course, as uh, years have gone by, uh, that has progressed with the announcement of uh, China launching its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which uh, is principally across um, most, if not all of those territories, uh, a few years back. So that's allowed us to, um, uh, uh, to expand our services and strategic advisory into the Belt and Road Initiative countries. Uh, my role as um, I'm the founding partner and chairman of a company, but my specific role today, uh, these days, is uh, uh, strategic advisory along the Belt and Road Initiative. We've been involved in that now for the past five years. All right, sounds good. Well, appreciate you for sharing that. And so, as, as I mentioned, One Belt, One Road Initiative, over here we hear somewhat of a very it's, very, it's very quiet on this side as far as just the development aspect and exactly what is it. And so, do you mind giving us some of the basics of what exactly that partnership and that uh, maritime aspect, of, what, what, what does all of that entail? All right, okay. Well, let's start first by just correcting the perception of the One Belt, One Road uh, tag. Uh, that was the original name given to, uh, to, to this concept, uh, but um, was officially renamed the Belt and Road Initiative about three years ago. And the reason for that is that uh, as China and Beijing progressed this, uh, uh, this policy, it became more than just one belt. 
and more than just one road. So the one belt, one road is the old way of describing it. It's much more than that. Uh, and the common and correct usage today is the Belt and Road Initiative. So what is it? Uh, it's, uh, there's two ways to look at it. Uh, one is politically, uh, which tends to be the way that uh, the US and, um, and to some extent Europe look at it. Uh, they view that as uh, perhaps a, a threatening uh, issue that China is going to perhaps swamp their markets or other markets with cheap Chinese goods. Uh, there's fears that uh, as the Belt and Road Initiative uh, extends across Eurasia and into other countries, that China's military will follow, and there are some uh, concerns about that. Uh, there's also uh, issues over China's uh, uh, apparent ease and desire to develop and extend free trade. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative includes a lot of uh, tax and free trade agreements, and this is coming at a time when both the United States and to some extent, again, the EU uh, is perhaps not so willing to engage in free trade agreements with other countries. So China's expansionist policy in free trade is not in alignment with that of the United States or the EU. That's a political viewpoint. Uh, on the other hand, there's the trade viewpoint, which um, sees uh, that China is uh, both willing to open up its markets and it is a market of um, 1.3 billion people, of which about 600 million are active consumers, a huge market, double that of the population of the United States. Uh, so that's significant. There's also the issue that China is wanting to uh, secure supplies. Uh, and this is not just uh, supplies uh, such as oil and gas, which is mainly now obtaining from Russia, but also other strategic commodities, uh, rare earths, uh, uh, gold, silver, other uh, commodities that it will require to develop things such as microchips, semiconductors, and so on and so forth. However, as regards supplying China, it should also be remembered that as a country, China has uh, one fifth of the global population, but just 20% of global arable land. So this means that China is uh, is agriculturally poor. It needs to import foods to feed its people. Where's it going to get that from? It's energy poor. It needs to import energy to keep everything ticking over, electricity and cars and everything else that we enjoy. China needs to import that. It doesn't have enough. Um, it's also water poor. Um, and we have problems now with global warming, glaciers um, are retreating. Uh, river levels drying up. China has issues with this as well. So uh, there's two ways of looking at it. Some countries see the China trade is that China just intends to sell cheap plastic goods to its countries and their own, uh, their own uh, manufacturers will not be able to compete. I personally think that's erroneous. Uh, China has already moved up the value chain in terms of what it makes. But I think the lesser part of it that is not so well recognized is just as I've said, China is a huge market, there are various uh, dynamics which dictate that it does need to buy certain products and goods. Um, and along with the ones I mentioned in energy and agriculture, it's also the demands of the Chinese people. And uh, here, China has, a, has an internal problem. It is a communist uh, country that is a one-party state. And um, although that, uh, that may be good in some ways in terms of ease of just getting legislation through, um, it creates problems in others. Because when there are problems in China, the Chinese people will point their fingers at the government. And there is only one government. This creates a situation whereby the Chinese government does have to be able to supply the Chinese people with what they need. And what's happened over the course of the last two decades is that the Chinese middle class has grown. Uh, China's middle class consumer base, as I said, is now 600 million people out of a total population of about 1.3 billion. Um, and they want to buy stuff. Uh, traveling abroad, they're going to the States. Wherever you travel internationally now, you will usually see Chinese tourists there. And uh, they want to have the lifestyles that they are becoming used to in traveling to other countries, such as North America and Europe, 
they want to have those same products and lifestyles available to them while living in China. And that creates a consumer demand. Uh, so the Belt and Road is partially designed to secure energy and agricultural supplies from China by making friendships and making trade agreements with other countries around the world. And we'll come to where that is, uh, those are later. But it's also about supplying China's consumer demand. Because as I said, if the Chinese Communist Party do not provide its own uh, nationals with those, uh, with those consumer goods, they're going to get unhappy. And when you're in a situation where there is only one government to get unhappy with, that creates social problems, which is something that uh, Beijing desperately wants to avoid. So in a nutshell, there's two ways of looking at the Belt and Road. One is political and to be concerned about it, and the other is trade and to perhaps um, uh, take advantage of that. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And so I'm curious to find out. And so you mentioned uh, uh, earlier on a couple of things that, you know, kind of requires China to actually go outside because all of the lack of things they have internally to support themselves. And so one thing that I haven't really heard much about, and, and let me know if you can comment on it or not, but over here, they, they've mentioned about ghost cities. And so there's been a lot of development there and a lot of land has not been utilized, malls, housing. Is that still prevalent there? And is that a part of, I guess, bringing the population out of the, the, the rural areas into the inner cities, or can you shine some light on that for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, there, there's a couple of issues with that. Um, first of all, uh, China's uh, population internally in China is on the move. Uh, I can't remember what the statistics are, uh, but two decades ago, something like 75% of Chinese nationals lived in rural countryside areas. Uh, there has been a distinct and significant move of that population to move to cities, uh, predominantly larger ones. Uh, everyone's familiar with uh, cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, but there are other huge cities uh, which have now developed far beyond the population levels that they were, say, 20 years ago. Cities such as uh, Wuhan, Chengdu, Chongqing, um, uh, Wulamuchi, uh, uh, in cities uh, such as uh, uh, Ningbo and uh, Hangzhou uh, and other, other areas uh, down in the south coast, and pretty much all along the coast, these cities have expanded their populations dramatically. So the majority of China's uh, population is now living in cities. That said, uh, China also needs to protect uh, its borders. And it, uh, it does have a policy of perhaps forward thinking. The Chinese are great uh, thinkers about what's going to come ahead in the future. In terms of ghost cities, well, there has been some criticism about that. Uh, I've been to some of these. Uh, it's a city I recall, uh, Manjoli which is uh, in northern China. It's in the uh, uh, Inner Mongolia province. Uh, it borders uh, Mongolia, the, the country, as well as uh, Russia. Uh, well, if you go to Manjoli, uh, the, uh, the population of that uh, city is about uh, 250,000. It's relatively small. It's agricultural based. Um, but it's right on, the, uh, on part of a trans-Siberian or trans-Mongolian railway, uh, which is significant. Uh, what the Chinese have done is that in anticipation of increased trade with Russia, they have redeveloped Manjoli. So you've got a city there with 250,000 people in it, but with housing uh, and uh, malls and an airport that's capable of housing a population of 5 million. So when you go there today, Manjoli looks empty. But uh, China, uh, China's relations with Russia and Russian Chinese trade is set to uh, expand, in fact, double from about 100 billion, 200 billion US dollars in the next five years. So, what will happen in the case of cities like Manjoli, which at present only have a population of a quarter of a million, is that that population will increase because Russia China trade is increasing. The Chinese will buy goods from Russia but process them just across the border. And this is exactly what's happening in cities such as Manjoli. The Russians are selling, selling them timber, but the Chinese have a significant uh, trading area in Manjoli, which converts all those raw logs 
into, uh, into timber that can be used, such as planks. They're building uh, houses that can be assembled, kit houses. Everything you can think that wood should be used for, the Chinese are doing that in Manjoli. They've even set up a timber exchange, a uh, futures exchange, so you can invest if you're a Chinese uh, businessman interested in securing longer term prices for wood and timber products, they have that in Manjoli. So what they've done, although you can go there and journalists do go to these places and say, hey, the Chinese have built this huge place, but there's hardly anybody here. Um, that's only part of the story. Uh, the Chinese have invested in advance to what they think is going to happen. So I think that the story of cities such as Manjoli, and there are others, if we go back there in two or three years time, the population will not be 250,000. It'll be one to two million uh, and with infrastructure uh, allowing for far more. I would suggest that's forward planning by the Chinese rather than over construction and over development in certain areas. Right, good point there. And I also agree with that. The fact they were ultimately, ultimately preparing for the future, because as you mentioned earlier on, they think well in advance. So you, you hit a couple of times the Russia and China relations. And so I've noticed over the last couple of decades, they've increased their partnerships and, and uh, collaborations on a variety of subject matter, including uh, their, their, their model of doing trade amongst each other, bilateral swaps and currency swaps. And so can you elaborate a little bit more on the, the depth of that and, and, and where that's heading, in your opinion? All right. Well, let's deal with the trade relations first, and then perhaps we can talk about the monetary aspect. In, in terms of trade, uh, uh, Moscow instigated uh, several years ago now uh, something called the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, on, on paper, uh, it looks uh, somewhat strange because the Eurasian Economic Union includes as members Armenia in the Caucasus, Belarus, which is a European country bordering Poland and Russia. Um, it also includes Kazakhstan, uh, the Central Asian state of Kyrgyzstan, uh, and Russia itself. So five nations uh, comprise the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of you will think, well, how, how does that make any sense? It's only when you look at where those countries are on a map that it starts to to form uh, uh, something which makes uh, a great deal of sense. Because the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, geographically, essentially fills a space right between the borders of the Eastern European Union uh, and Western China. So if there's going to be an increase of trade between China and the European Union, the Eurasian Economic Union sits right in between. And this has great significance as it is a free trade block for goods passing from China overland to the European Union and vice versa, because it's free trade within the Eurasian Economic Union. What's further significant about this is that China has signed off a free trade agreement with the Eurasian Economic Union last year. Why haven't you heard more about it? Um, you will do. Uh, it's just that uh, although the free trade agreement has been signed, China and the EAU are still negotiating the tariffs uh, to be eliminated on goods, uh, tariffs to be eliminated or, or reduced on goods to be traded between the two. Uh, when that is done and those negotiations are currently underway, uh, you'll have uh, goods which can be transported duty-free from China right across the Eurasian Economic Union to the borders of the European Union. And that has significance in terms of uh, the cost. There's no duties, the cost, the transportation times, the ease of acquiring Chinese-made products in Europe. Um, so what's the outcome of this? Europe is holding its hands up and saying, whoa, hang on a second. We don't want all these cheap Chinese goods coming in. But as I said, um, China is also product and uh, consumable hungry. And I think one of the tricks that the European Union is missing is that uh, it really should be getting its act together uh, and perhaps participating more with the Eurasian Economic Union over certain products that could be to the EU's benefit that could be traded with the European Union and thus on to China. It should, I should also point out that the European Union and China at this time do not have a free trade agreement. So what's going on in China and the Eurasian Economic Union is of a significant strategic importance. Uh, and that will become very, very apparent 
perhaps uh, towards the end of next year or, or early the year after that, when China has, uh, the, the Eurasian Economic Union, have agreed reductions and elimination of tariffs between them. It's going to be a significant development. Um, so that's the issue over trade. Um, it's also one of the reasons why, as I said, uh, Russia-China trade uh, is expected to double. It's currently uh, at around about $100 billion. Um, it's expected to double to $200 billion over the next uh, five years. That's a growth rate of 20% per annum, significant. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on. In terms of the money uh, aspect, um, that's, a, that's a different story, but of course related. So let's just, I can just uh, perhaps outline on that. Um, Russia, of course, has been subject to sanctions from the United States uh, for the last uh, four or five years. We all know the reasons why, uh, but people can argue about that for some time. But the fact remains is uh, that, uh, that Russia is under sanctions from the United States. Uh, part of that has included uh, the, um, uh, the weaponization of the US dollar uh, in terms of uh, uh, Russian trade. Uh, the ruble uh, significantly lost a lot of value immediately after the sanctions were imposed, and it remains a very low uh, value currency, far lower than it actually should be. Uh, so Russia's experience uh, over the last five years has been that the US has, uh, has, has manipulated, in, in some thinking, uh, the US dollar to push the ruble low and make Russia weaker. Uh, now, this is a situation that... Uh, Russia has been uh, mulling over, but China has also found, uh, we're all aware that uh, the US and China uh, are having a, a form of sanctions, albeit hopefully temporary, in, uh, in the trade war that's going on. But uh, Washington has also placed the Chinese renminbi yuan under pressure. Uh, again, this use of the US dollar uh, as a weapon to put pressure on countries. Now, when you do that, um, uh, the US dollar is supposed to be the world's currency. It's not really supposed to be used as a tool to promote uh, US trade and policy agendas. Um, that's not what it was intended to do, and that's certainly not what a globally accepted currency should be doing. Um, but it has been. Uh, uh, Washington has been using the dollar like that because it can. Uh, that has led to a situation whereby increasingly there is, uh, uh, there is growing distrust of, uh, of the US dollar as a currency to trade with. Uh, this isn't just because of the use of a dollar as a weapon. It's also uh, due to uh, the United States um, uh, effectively controlling the SWIFT uh, payment network through which international transactions uh, uh, go through. That network, which is actually based in, in Europe, uh, is, uh, is essentially controlled by the US. And what it does is it means that uh, transactions from one country to another, even though that transaction may not go via the US, is rooted through a US uh, um, uh, a cooperative uh, bank. Uh, so a, a US bank is within that, monitoring the transaction and charging for it. Um, so this is why you have now in transactions, and have done for the last decade or so, a US corresponding bank involved in financial transfers. The issue, and that goes through something called the SWIFT payment network. There are others, but SWIFT is a dominant one. Um, now, the issue with that is that um, uh, the United States has the power to cut that network off, and it has done um, uh, applications with Russia, which means that using the SWIFT payment network, uh, you can't get money out of Russia or into Russia. And the US did this with, uh, with Russia shortly after the sanctions, um, they did restore it, but it had the effect of, um, uh, of um, preventing uh, elderly Russian pensioners in Russia from receiving money sent to them from their relatives overseas. And that's, uh, that's not cool. Um, Russia also cut off Iran from the SWIFT payment network. And Iran was pretty much fully dependent on that network uh, after uh, the United States pulled out of the Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, this has made it extremely difficult for Iran uh, to trade internationally. It's got oil, but it hasn't got any mechanism to uh, either receive 
or uh, or send us dollars thanks for watching this interview if you're enjoying content like this feel free to become a part of the rtd community by becoming a member via patreon all it takes is a monthly contribution of about five dollars a month for more great content such as this just scroll down beneath this video here and click the patreon link and then hit this tab right here to become a member of the team looking forward to bringing you more great content now let's get back to this interview thanks um so it's a way in which um the united states is using both the u.s dollar and the swift payment mechanism to, to punish countries that don't do what it wants to do. Um, now, where, where the US, I think, has overstepped the mark is it is okay to punish companies that do bad things like infringe on human rights and uh, get involved in wars and kill people, all those terrible things. But it's not okay to do that when you're, you're actually trying to deliberately inhibit other countries' trade because that doesn't fit with or competes with the United States. That's not cool. So what, um, what this all transpires, what all this has meant, is that the United States, uh, sorry, um, Russia, China, and other countries are looking at, uh, at uh, divesting themselves from the US dollar and building up alternatives to the SWIFT payment network. And this is happening. Um, the, uh, the Russians have um, de-dollarized uh, the Eurasian Economic Union trade uh, by 70%. So uh, out of all the 100% of Eurasian Economic Union trade, and that is a $1.9 trillion economy, only 30% of that is now conducted in dollars. The rest is conducted uh, in rubles or in currencies of the member countries concerned. Um, China has also been supporting um, uh, the use of the ruble and the renminbi yuan in its bilateral trade with Russia and uh, the Economic Union uh, uh, as well. So the countries do not have to go use the US dollar. They can use their own currencies. This, is, this um, whole momentum of not using the US dollar and uh, creating alternative payment mechanisms to SWIFT is gaining momentum. Uh, the BRICS bloc, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, um, have also announced that they are creating XPay, uh, which is a system whereby nationals of each of those countries, and we should not forget that, both of, that all of those five countries are significant in their own right, uh, significant uh, uh, global players. Nationals in those companies, uh, in those countries, will be able to use BRICS pay to, uh, to receive and pay for goods without having to go through the SWIFT network. Uh, the BRICS nations have also declared that they wish to de-dollarize uh, 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 multilateral trade between themselves. It's going to have a significant impact because uh, all of those are emerging economies, particularly Brazil and India. You add in Russia and China as well, and it's going to have an impact. Uh, countries such as Iran, they're creating uh, cryptocurrencies and also wish to sign up to, uh, to limit the use of the US dollar. Well, they can't use it anyway right now. But other countries such as Turkey and others throughout Central Asia, Africa and Asia are starting to move away from US dollar trade and are starting to look at alternative to SWIFT payment mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Why it pans out and develops um, what the end result will be is as yet unclear. But what is clear is that there are efforts being put in to, uh, to move away from US dollar trade, and there are efforts being made in which are technically complicated, uh, but there are efforts being put in to, uh, to move away from the SWIFT payment mechanism. Mm. That also coincides, incidentally, with the rise of blockchain uh, and fintech technologies, uh, which China and Russia and India uh, and others are all heavily invested in. Uh, now, that will enable not just the, uh, the smooth passage of goods uh, through across uh, regions such as Eurasian Economic and other free trade zones, but it also allows the transfer of currencies uh, and the rise and uh, potential use of cryptocurrencies is also in that mix. Um, as I said, where it all pans out and what we end up with is, is a big unknown. But what is for sure is that uh, people are looking at the technical developments on that and trying to work out how those things can be regulated and put into position so that uh, countries have alternatives to both the US dollar and SWIFT. Long, long speech, but complicated subjects. And in a nutshell, that's what I, that's what I have to say about it.
Right. But that, that's great. And I agree. I appreciate you for sharing that because I'm curious. My uh, follow up question was going to be about BRICS pay. And so assuming that's going to be a digital payment method, I'm assuming uh, the governments will be able to utilize. But what, what role does gold have in this ordeal? Because gold is we hear a lot about the, everybody getting their tonnage up these days. And so I'm assuming gold has a future in all these negotiations and deals. Any word on what where gold fits in all this? Yeah, um, I think there's two ways to look at that. Uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, the the countries that are buying uh, or acquiring gold, where where, where are they? Um, well, R Russia has the largest gold reserves in the world, so they are acquiring gold because they're mining it and putting it out into the market. You that, say that Russia? I'm sorry. You say Russia has the largest gold reserves in the world? Uh, first uh, largest or second largest. Okay, so, okay, because so, so apparently for over here in Fort Knox, we're supposed to have 8,300 tons, but that's yet to be confirmed officially, so. Well, what I'm, okay, there's, there's a difference in what we're talking about here. Okay. There, there, there's gold bars, such as you've got in Fort Knox, and there's uh, gold in the ground, and that's what I'm referring to, okay? So, it hasn't, so it's there, it just hasn't been pulled out, and because uh, you've still got to invest in the mining and do all that and make it pure. So what I'm referring to in terms of gold reserves is not the bars of gold held by the central bank, which is what you're talking about. I'm talking about the proven gold reserves that are in the ground. Okay. okay? So um, uh, where, where are we with that? Russia is a major supplier of gold. So it's, it's mining it. It's adding it to its own stockpiles, which is one reason why the Russian uh, uh, gold, federal gold reserves uh, in the bank are increasing. Uh, but there's also other issues in there. Um, China is increasing its gold reserves as well, uh, both at the central bank level, but also on a consumer level, because the Chinese consumers in terms of jewelry uh, are currently um, uh, probably about the largest in the world. So there's a huge demand for gold. There's a lot of Chinese consumers, as we said before, the middle class is growing. They want gold jewelry. The girls want their earrings, all that kind of stuff. So China's uh, acquisition of gold is partly to do with, um, uh, with securing central bank uh, credibility, but also to do with the fact that China is an increasingly affluent society and people want to show that off. The same is true of India, another country which is buying a lot of gold. I think the third largest at the moment after Russia and China. Uh, the Indians are buying a lot of gold. They always have done. If, uh, if anyone has been to an Indian wedding, you'll see the Indian ladies with all the family jewels and necklaces and bracelets and bangles and tiaras. Goodness knows what they, they, they love to dress themselves up in. Um, in India, uh, historically, has, uh, families have always hoarded gold just in case of uh, problems in the country. And we should, we should remember that there have been significant problems within India, within living memory, partition and other issues as well. So it's natural that wealthy families do try and hoard gold. It all comes out on display at weddings, but otherwise it's locked away in family safes. The Indians also love their jewelry. They've got a big consumer market. Uh, so the Indian economy is booming. It's running about 9.2% right now. And Indian ladies and uh, their boyfriends are buying jewelry for them. So they are consuming gold. However, uh, so there, there's, two, there's two sides to this uh, acquisition of gold. One is uh, consumer trends. Uh, the China market is expanding. It's growing more wealthy. The India market is expanding. It's growing more wealthy. Uh, even the Russian market is expanding, albeit at a slower rate, but there's plenty of money in Russia too. Uh, but they're also underpinning their central bank reserves with gold. Uh, and that's an, interesting, that's an interesting thing. There's a lot of debate about this. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, on both sides of the coin. There's some people uh, suggesting, including some influential economists, that suggests that the US uh, economy, which is debt-backed, uh, is not ultimately sustainable. Um, it's a debt-driven economy, uh, and perhaps that uh, returning to an economic basis which is uh, supported by real proven assets, which Russia for sure has, um, uh, is perhaps a better way to manage the economy. There are concerns that a debt-backed economy uh, is subject to fluctuations. Uh, we've already had the subprime crisis in the US. Um, there, is, uh, there is concern 
that the world uh, reports issued by the, uh, the, the World Bank just a couple of weeks ago, suggesting that the world is walking into another financial crisis. We didn't learn from a subprime thing. Uh, and if that happens, there, there, are some, uh, uh, there, there are some commentators, including one of the ex-governors uh, of the Bank of England, who last week suggested that if that were to happen, the United States would be extremely badly hit um, and could suffer uh, extensive economic damage. Um, those are times, or these are times, where if we really are faced with those sorts of problems, it is better to have gold um, rather than pieces of paper with bonds and stocks and shares. So it is an interesting development uh, that uh, the central banks are, uh, are acquiring gold, perhaps to hedge against potential problems with U.S. debt. Um, I'm not an economist. You'd need to talk to one for perhaps better and not an American one, talk to, talk to a more, <laughs> a, a less partisan economist uh, about uh, the state of the US dollar against uh, gold and other assets. But nonetheless, there is a call by particularly Russia and other asset rich countries with stuff in the ground. But perhaps a better way to base wealth upon is to actually base it upon how much you actually have in your own country. However, let's just expand this issue over the, uh, over the use of gold. Uh, China established the Silk Road Gold Fund uh, a few years back as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, and that is, uh, that is traded on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, now, the, uh, the idea behind that is an interesting one, uh, because a lot of the countries along the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, especially in Central Asia, are poor. And I'm talking about countries like uh, Afghanistan uh, and uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan to some extent. Now, Afghanistan, although it's been beset by political problems and war and terrorism for many, many years now, um, actually does have fairly significant gold deposits. There is gold in Denbar Hills. Um, the problem is that the Afghanis don't have the money to be able to get it out. The Silk Road Gold Fund um, uh, does have that money. And what the Silk Road Gold Fund is doing is, in, is investing in equipment into countries such as Afghanistan. It will... It will go in, provide the equipment, mine the gold, charge Afghanistan for this service. But uh, assuming the gold reserves are more than the cost of mining it, we'll split the proceeds of the gold reserves with the uh, sovereign nation. So in this way, uh, the Silk Road Gold Fund acquires, uh, acquires assets, it, requires go it, uh, it acquires gold. But so do poor countries, such as Afghanistan, as an example, that could not access this gold anyway, but then can access what the Silk Road Gold Fund has, has mined and add that to their own sovereign wealth, thereby getting the country out of, its, uh, out of its current position and creating wealth for countries like Afghanistan. That, to me, sounds like a great idea. Um, and it's one of the initiatives that I think the, the China and the Belt and Road and countries that are participating in that can, be, can feel proud of. Right. Wow. That's a lot of information there. So as we draw towards the end of our discussion, uh, I want to get your thoughts on where we're currently at now with the Belt and Road Initiative and where do you see it being in five years, 10 years, and will it be the next uh, global power structure that the world has to recognize from a possible uh, a new world reserve currency status type of position uh, in the future or what? What's the, what's the present and what's the future look like for the Belt and Road Initiative? All right. Um, there, there's a lot there. Um, first of all, let me, let me tell, talk about perhaps some of the misconceptions over China loading up some of the Belt and Road countries with debt. Let's talk about that. Uh, a, a, a frequently uh, mentioned issue uh, is debt uh, laden onto Sri Lanka for the port of Hambantota, Tota uh, and, uh, and uh, the Sri Lanka not being able to repay that and the Chinese taking the port as... Uh, uh, collateral in return for a 99-year lease. Um, so that's made the, uh, that's made the headlines. Uh, it's referred to on a frequent basis uh, and uh, as a bad thing and how China is loading up small countries with debt. Now, I happen to live in Sri Lanka during a part of the year, uh, and I live actually close to Hambantota. So let's just construct what actually happened. The Sri Lankan government at the time, an elected government, agreed a loan deal from China uh, for the building of not just a port, an airport, but also roads, highways to connect it to the capital. 
uh, Hanbin Tota is in the southeast of the uh, country. The current only international airport is in the northwest. It's a significant difference. So they negotiated a loan, um, uh, but the Sri Lankan government, when uh, the, the government and the president at the time, uh, when receiving a loan from China at a rate of 2%, which is in uh, standard norms for countries like China, the Sri Lankan government themselves asked that to be increased to 6% interest. So guess where that 4% went? It uh, allegedly went to the then president's offshore accounts in Switzerland. So is that China's fault? No. Now, let's talk about the port. The port was built, Sri Lanka, uh, there was an election, the new president came in, new government found out, but actually they couldn't afford to, uh, to maintain this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, this debt. So they renegotiated it and agreed to lease the, um, uh, the port uh, area to China for 99 years. That looks bad, um, but you know, China still wants to secure against its assets. What isn't mentioned, is that the infrastructure that China built as part of that port, and I'm talking specifically about the roads and other infrastructure that they built, um, that's all in place. And uh, what's happened has been that foreign direct investment, not related to the port or airport at Hanban Tota, but in terms of the tourism industry, uh, hotels, uh, other tourism related uh, uh, facilities has exploded. So you've got a port there, which isn't very productive, which was paid for, but you've also got a road. Now, when you look at the total amount that China lent Sri Lanka to build the port, the airport, and the roads, it's some in the region of about $3.8 billion. It's a lot of money. But when you look at the increase of tourism to infrastructure and the foreign direct investment that has poured into that country since that infrastructure, particularly the roads, was built, it's far in excess of $3.8 billion. In fact, it's running at about $3.8 billion a year. So the message I've got is that when you're looking at China debt on Belt and Road projects, um, it's not about how much something costs. Um, it's, like, it's like your phone, right? Your phone costs a few hundred dollars, but it's worth a lot more to you in how you use it. You don't buy it to show off a great phone. You use it to, to speak to your friends, to make business, to keep in contact. So that's worth far more to you than the cost of a phone. And that's exactly the same with the Belt and Road Initiative and roads and bridges and ports and airports. It's no point in looking at the cost. It's what you do with that and the money that's generated from that that is really, really the important thing. And most commentators forget about that. Um, so in terms of the debt, that's what I've got to say. In terms of the overall picture, uh, uh, I think that uh, there's, a, there's an old saying, which is partially true. I have a lot of China experience. I lived there for 25 years in the mainland. Uh, and uh, I, I've heard a lot that when China means win-win, it means they win twice. Um, they can sometimes do that. But this is, after all, a, a foreign relations exercise. Uh, I've studied the new foreign investment law, which had just been amended by China. And actually, it includes better and more provisions for IP security, it, uh, it opens up China's market for greater participation uh, for foreign companies to get involved with tenders in China, greater participation for companies in China's Belt and Road projects. China needs foreign expertise to carry out some of the infrastructure it wants to build. And I think that uh, really now is just the start of what we're going to go and see. What I think we're, uh, will happen is, although it's true to say that uh, I think about 84% of, of Belt and Road Initiative projects have gone to uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises. I think that number is going to start to fall. I think you're going to see far more foreign uh, investment in Belt and Road Initiative projects. But it's up to foreign governments and foreign companies themselves to do the research on that uh, to find out what's going on, how they can participate, what are the laws, we're talking about bilateral uh, laws here between China and another country, or maybe more than one other country. So you need to look at all of those, uh, those legal and tax issues. So there's, there's a lot to go on, but I do perceive that foreign investment into the Belt and Road Initiative is only going to increase. It's a significant interest in investment. It's a significant project. Uh, and I think that anything that uh, is committed to better infrastructure, to better unite countries and cities around the world has got to be a good thing.
but it's up to the local governments, not the Chinese, as to how they put that into practice on their own countries. All right, sounds good. And the very last question, I'll be, I'll be, I regret if I didn't ask you this, the <laughs> continent of Africa. Uh, what role does China have in the development of the continent of Africa and what's the future plans? Will there be a chance of bringing some form of, some form of prosperity to the people of the continent of Africa through the trade deals and them funding all the infrastructure down on the continent? Where does Africa play in all this? Well, Afri Africa is going to be a significant player. Um, and uh, China is uh, heavily involved. Uh, there's something called the, uh, the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, AFCFTA, which was signed off by nearly all of the African countries earlier this year. Um, that was a Chinese-supported initiative. And, um, uh, you know, Af Africa is, is a diverse and fascinating content, continent, uh, but its countries and governments and peoples don't always see eye to eye. Um, the fact that China got the African Continental Free Trade Agreement done uh, is significant. What does that agreement do? Uh, before, uh, if goods passed from one African country to another, you'd have to pay a duty on that, inter, uh, that, that inter, intra African trade. The African Free, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement eliminates uh, tariffs on 90% of all the products traded in Africa. That's great news if you are a business that wants to buy different things from different African countries, put them all together in one factory somewhere, and then resell them onto the African market or export them to other markets. Uh, it's a great, great deal. Um, and this is why China uh, has been uh, active in investing in uh, African countries. And I should also mention that Russia has been doing that as well. Um, if you look at my Silk Road Briefing, silkroadbriefing.com website, type in Africa in search. I just wrote a, uh, a piece on, uh, on the Africa situation and China trade and the free trade zones that China has set up there. Um, the other issue to, to realize about Africa is that when you look at the wage demographics, China became wealthy because 30 years ago, uh, Chinese wages were not, uh, were not very high. Uh, now it's become um, uh, significant, it's become a middle uh, class society and wages are higher. If, you want, if you're in an industry which requires a, a lower uh, wage uh, overhead, then the places to, to go to right now are uh, Southeast Asia, some of the ASEAN countries, which are still developing, and Africa. Uh, so if you look at those, there's, there's a lot of diversity between Southeast Asia and there's a lot of diversity between African countries. But those, uh, so you need to look around at which, are, which, has got the, which has got the productivity levels and the low worker uh, wages uh, in parity, so you can get the, get the benefits of both. But they are there. And I think that China and Russia have been very astute in targeting uh, Southeast Asia and Africa as where the next global workshop of the world is going to be. Southeast Asia, ASEAN, some of the other uh, Southern Asian countries, as well as Africa, is going to be the global uh, workshop of the world for the next 20 or 30 years. It's already happening, and you and I, my friend, will be having Made in Africa labels on our shirts, and perhaps in 10 years, even in our iPhones. Um, it's happening, and um, I think it'll happen sooner rather than later. The future for Africa, I think, is extremely bright. Wow. Well, that's great news to hear. So, Chris Devonshire Ellis, it's been great having you here on Rethinking a Dollar. I've definitely learned a lot myself and get, been caught up to speed on what's happening in that region. So, it's definitely uh, it's been great talking to you. Can you now point people to your direction so they can probably do some research and, and re do, read into some things that you're doing and, and to be a blessing to your work? Yeah, please. Um, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can email me. Uh, it's chris, C H R I S, at Des Shira, D E Z S H I R A dot com. Please send me an email, sensible ones only. Um, you can look at our resources. I, uh, I contribute to uh, Silk Road Briefing, Silk Road Briefing, or one word, dot com. It's free. You can subscribe. So if you're interested in the Belton Road, have a look at that. Uh, we, if you look also on the top, you can subscribe to our other uh, briefings, all free, all complimentary. And there are briefings there about China, uh, Russia, India, ASEAN, so on and so forth. So um, but go to silkroadbriefing.com and that's where all the stuff is about the Belt and Road. 
All right. Sounds good. Well, Chris, it's been great once again, as I mentioned, looking forward to continue to follow your work and stay in touch and find out how things unfold because definitely uh, everything you mentioned is going to be a part of our future. So I think it's well worth our time to stay up to date on what's going on. So once again, thanks for joining us here on Rethinking a Dollar. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.